Good morning. This is National Nurses Week, so we'd like to take our prayer time and in community offer up a prayer for those nurses who've been serving tirelessly through this health crisis, through this pandemic. I'm going to play a short video um, expression of prayer. And during that time, if you're in our web chat, if you're on our Facebook Live and have the chat available to you, Please, in the next 60 seconds, add the name of a nurse who you want included in our prayer time this morning. So join us in reflection on that, and then we'll come back and pray together. You know, it's um, kind of an ironic tragedy that this being National Nurses Week in Canada, and it was also um, the week in which the first pract a registered nurse practitioner succumbed to a coronavirus who died because of contracting COVID-19. So we want to remember uh, today, especially in prayer, Brian Beatty and um, his friends and family that are grieving that loss. Uh, but join me, if you will, in a moment of prayer for these nurses. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the gift of the Sabbath and all that offers restoration and reprieve from the weekly grind. But Lord, uh, I think of the nurses who are engaged in the ministry of healing. And uh, much like the priests of the Old Testament, their work was an offering to you. Their, their profession, their career was ministry, was an essential service, and continued even on the Sabbath um, to bring you glory and to worship your name. Lord, I'm reading out here some of the names that have been shared by our online community we think of nurses like wendy chizaya garcia michelle josephine martina merla emmy lv peterson joanna grace ojechi michelle vincent jackie reginder dina edna Linda, Vanessa, Rowena, Nisa, Alice, Anita, Sigourney, Lottie, Esther and Ashley, Alan, Chris, Arlene, Irene, Mary, Kit, and Wendy. These are just some of the names, Lord, that come to mind when we think about people in the nursing profession. And Lord, we thank you that they reflect an image of who you are. So reveal to us as we um, open your word, as we reflect on scripture, as we reflect on those you've inspired to be moved by your heart of compassion, to be moved by your character and your nature as a God who not only heals us, but who nurses us. 
We ask your blessing upon our time together today. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for uh, participating. And of course, if there's names that I missed, I will review them and make it a point of prayer for um, myself and our leadership team this week. Um, but we do recognize uh, that it is uh, Nurses Week this week, National Nurses Week. And I want to share with you uh, the story of a nurse who was born May 12th in 1820. You see, National Nurses Week coincides or was scheduled on the anniversary of Florence Nightingale's death. And this week uh, in 2020 marked the 200 year anniversary of Florence Nightingale being born. She was born to a wealthy British family, but she was born in Italy and was named after the city of her birth, Florence. Uh, later, they moved back to England, and Florence was raised by Unitarian Christian parents who, again, being wealthy and well-educated, um, shaped her views and her identity and exposed her to people who really championed her in all her cleverness and smarts. Now, Florence wrote in her journal that she felt compelled at a young age to serve God, to understand her identity and purpose as, some, as a caregiver, as someone who would help the less fortunate. And she attributes this to uh, her, her teenage years as she was 16 or 17, having a spiritual awakening and a sense that she was being called to give her life in service to the less fortunate. And that became her passion and her call in nursing. She really um, studied. She had the privilege of tutors and an education that most girls in her time did not have. And she applied her scientific knowledge to her Christian values. And she made the connection that impoverished people who lived in poor conditions were more likely to suffer from disease and sickness and ill health, and that by creating a clean, bright uh, environment for them, by improving their living conditions, they would improve, she could improve their health. Now, today in 2020, we sort of go like, duh, we can connect the dots easily without a science degree, without a medical degree. But at her time, this was revolutionary. Germ theory was just emerging. And despite her parents' very liberal, egalitarian views and perspective, um, Florence desired to be a nurse. And her parents were not supportive of this, particularly her mother. Her mother knew that if she would just get married, her life would be easy. She'd be well taken care of. She can con continue her personal studies of interest, but would not have to put herself at risk. However, Florence would not be deterred. And in 1854, after studying in Germany the uh, art of nursing, she was called upon and she and about 30 other nurses um, went to the war front in Crimea, Crimea. And she found that the soldiers there were injured and kept in just deplorable conditions. It was unsanitary. They were wounded and lying in their own filth. There were rodents and bugs uh, rampant in the quarters. And so she immediately got to work just cleaning up the place, having it scrubbed top to bottom and treating these wounded soldiers as if they were still valuable human souls. And in doing so, she um, was also a statistician and she kept careful records and she was one of the innovators in statistical graphics and she kind of pioneered or really um, made popular uh, presenting the statistics of her patients, their health and recovery, tracking that with pie charts. So she was a bit of a, a mathematician and a visual communicator. 
Now, she had received several marriage proposals. Uh, her mom was working hard behind the scenes to just get her married. But by the age of 30, Florence had um, t taken a vow of chastity and said, marriage is just going to deter me from my purpose and my calling in nursing. And so she would spend the rest of her life devoted to her craft. And when illness um, kept her from... Uh, being a nurse practitioner herself, she transitioned to training and educating other nurses. Um, at the time, uh, before Florence Nightingale uh, adopted the practice of nursing, this was a profession that um, fell well below her social status. At that time, nursing was kind of um, viewed as despicable or a low-grade menial work. Nurses were often found to be drunk on the job, and they were known for stealing their patients' possessions. This really frustrated Florence, and part of opening up a school and a new training facility was to elevate the profession and value of nursing. She wanted to not only improve the quality of care given by nurses, but to have nurses understand their important role. And her spiritual conviction largely propelled and fueled her professional passion. She was convicted that by nursing and restoring health to fellow humanity, she was bringing a little bit of the kingdom of God back to earth. Nursing for her was... Uh, establishing, establishing and painting a picture of what the kingdom of God really was about. She thought she could bring earth and heaven uh, closer in recognizing this God who, who healed and this God who um, wants to see humanity restored to its original creation. So Florence uh, devoted herself to that. She opened the first secular school of nursing, which again was revolutionary. At the time, you would have a Catholic schools and only Catholics would attend. You would have Protestant schools, only Protestants would attend. Well, she opened the admission for her schools and her students, regardless of religious background, even Christian or not, which was very in inclusive and very progressive in that time. She also uh, understood that spirituality, her own spirituality, was an integral part because nurses are asked to love, to care for, and to sacri sacrificially give and serve their patients. So your worldview, your perspective, your foundational understanding of the sacredness of life or a human being representing the image of God or being created by God, she felt um, deep deeply impacted a nurse's motivation to care for that living being. She also um, believed that taking care of oneself spiritually was key to combat caregiving fatigue. And we know this scripture tells us that it's the fruit of the spirit that gives us things like patience, long suffering, kindness, our sin sick nature would, would become impatient, uh, qu quick to anger, and um, easily frustrated with the stresses and challenges of our own lives, let alone bearing the burden of somebody else. But as we connect with God, the Holy Spirit empowers us in these attributes and these traits of long suffering, patience, kindness, well beyond our human capacity. You may not know that um, Florence, well, she was known not just for her physical care in her, in her innovations when it came to statistics and sanitation, but it was also her care of her patients. She would often, after her work day, making rounds, attending to physical needs, spend the evenings on her wards, talking to her patients, helping them. These young men, if they were illiterate or unschooled, often the ones uh, conscripted to military service, she would teach them the basics of reading and writing so that they could um, communicate with their families and loved ones back home. She developed this uh, nickname or identity as the lady with the lamp 
because she just would not stop. At the after supper, um, she would walk the halls with a lantern in her hand, checking to make sure that her patients were sleeping comfortably and making adjustments or uh, meeting their needs, praying with them if they, f- they were um, racked with insomnia. And so I think of, of Florence Nightingale as one of the original light bearers. In scripture, we think of light bearers as Christians uh, because the Bible tells us we are to be a light, like a, like a light. Uh, don't you know, put your light under a bush or hide it, but we are to be like a lamp to the world uh, and a light to other people's feet. And Florence Nightingale, I like to think of her as, as one of the OG light bearers. You may not know that she also um, kind of rebelled or questioned some of the Christian teachings she was raised with. And towards the end of her life, wrote a work of theology called Suggestions for Thought. She was somebody who really wrestled with this idea that a good, loving, kind God would condemn souls to hell for all eternity. And so she was working and and developing a new uh, insight or a new belief uh, counter to the majority of in her time, kind of with this understanding that everyone would have an opportunity to be reconciled with God. And sometimes she would comfort her patients with this idea with her philosophy. One example is that uh, one evening she was ministering to a dying prostitute. And this young lady was so consumed. Her, she was in mental anguish, just convinced that because of her lifestyle, because of what she practiced, um, what she knew to be immoral, she was going to be a burning in hell for eternity. And so she said to her nurse, Florence, pray, pray to God that you would never find yourself in the same state of despair as I am in right now. And Florence replied to her tenderly, Oh, my dear girl, are you not now in your concern for me more merciful than the God you would pray to. The real God is far more merciful than any human creature can ever imagine. How powerful to think that um, somebody who feels just wretched, racked with grief, uh, shame, regret, and guilt, if that individual expresses mercy and a desire for another human being to not experience the pain, the anguish, the mental torment of an an uncertain eternity, that Florence could flip that and turn that into a spiritual lesson to encourage and coax this, this young lady to imagine God is far more merciful than you're being to me in this moment. Rest assured. I mean, it's not recorded, but I imagine that she would point to the, the account of the thief on the cross, another individual co- convicted criminal who hung next to Jesus, and yet in those dying moments recognized um, their state of their soul, their state of being, recognized the goodness of God, recognized the Son of God, the Savior of the world was beside them, and in their dying moments simply said, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus could promise them in that moment, certainly today I'm making you that promise. You will be with me in paradise. Florence Nightingale also challenged people who want to go to heaven that they first must make heaven here on earth in their interactions with each other, in their care for each other. She believed in a very uh, practiced faith that that faith without works is indeed dead, as uh, Paul writes to us in the New Testament. She believed that to be a fellow worker with God was the highest aspiration we could conceive possible or even be capable of achieving. And she felt that genuine religion had to manifest itself in the care and love for others. Um, When it came to scripture, she said, 
Uh, she, she considered herself a little bit mystical, um, a bit of a mystic, but she pointed to John's gospel and said, I have lived my life according to the gospel of John, however imperfectly, I have lived up to it, and that is and will be enough. In her, uh, one of her last diary entries, um, she said, as she reflected on her life, when many years ago, I thought about my future. My one idea was not organizing a hospital, but organizing a religion. Seven years after Florence was born, twin girls were born, this time not in Europe, but in Gorham, Maine. Elizabeth and her twin sister Ellen were born on November 26th in 1827. Here is another lady who would significantly revolutionize and reform healthcare practices in North America. She would become one of the, the leading champions and revolutionaries in terms of vegetarianism as an adopted diet and lifestyle. While Nightingale had her training school for nurses at St. Thomas Hospital, the medical missionary training school for nurses was opened in Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. The philosophical beliefs of each of these women were underpinned by their spiritual beliefs, and they both saw the connection between physical health and spiritual health. They both identified concepts like basic cleanliness, water, nutrition, fresh air and sunshine, rest, as being God-given elements and components for our health. These uh, concepts were in key components of the reform practices that they implemented. While Florence Nightingale's source of reform was her passion, her personal observation, her intelligence, and her education, she reformed nursing by using her own political influence and money. Ellen White, Ellen Harmon had uh, neither political influence or copious amounts of wealth. She was born into a poor farming family. Yet her source came directly from God and her passion was equal to that of Florence's to, to live obedient to God's calling and to care for fellow humanity. Her reforms were built on the motivation of divine inspiration. For the average person, even physicians at the time, this middle 19th century, um, again, phys doctors were still using things like opium, mercury, arsenic, even tobacco to treat or heal diseases. Aspirin was unknown of, as were technologies like x-ray machines, antibiotics, pasteurization, immunization, blood transfusions, all were not readily uh, known or available to the general population. So Ellen White's vision of physical health and the treatments that were available to even the poorest individuals was incredibly valuable to transitioning um, her neighborhoods and societies into a more healthful state using the God-given elements um, that, that were present and accessible. Um, little, little time, little thought was given at her, during her time to those essentials, which we now take for granted, especially in this uh, time of a global pandemic, the basic principles of hand hygiene um, is what is keeping the majority of our population safe right now. In comparison, though, while Florence, uh, as a young girl, imagined herself not organizing a hospital, but a religion, um, 
Ellen White probably had no visions of organizing a religion, and yet that is what God led her to do. She saw the value of combining health ministry with a spiritual focus. And uh, she would become one of the co-founders of this Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Her health message would be developed right alongside the doctrinal messages. And um, the church would be known not only for its kind of peculiar theology and fundamental beliefs, a few that were quite revolutionary and shifted from mainstream Christianity, but it would be known for its establishment of hospitals. Um, one today still um, excels in healthcare, Loma Linda University, and it also is the center, the epicenter of what's known in the world as a blue zone, where people's longevity is much greater than anywhere else in the world, and not just longevity, but seniors who are experiencing life in complete health and wellness with their mental and physical faculties in um, great shape. It is written that Ellen White's contribution to an advanced understanding of health and disease was attributed to her visions of inspiration, her spirit-directed ability to perceive the harmony of her insights with the maze of her current context and um, prevailing opinion, and her governing understanding of this great controversy theme that really motivated her to educate people about basic health principles. She understood that the enemy was Satan and his MO was all about destroying us, to uh, deceive us into practices and lifestyles that would be self-destructive, to um, cripple us mentally, spiritually, physically, in order that we could no longer be light bearers to the world around us. Satan was uh, an oppressor who wants to bring darkness of all kind to hold us back. And she saw that, that God had given us the tools and wanted to equip and empower us um, with things that were readily available and easy, within easy reach and accessible to combat that. The lifestyle of Seventh-day Adventists is reflected in a phenomenal accumulation today of published research papers about incorporating simple practices like daily exercise, sticking to drinking fresh water, um, this rhythm of weekly rest, uh, relationships, and a trust in a higher power. It could be that no other religious group has attracted so much recent interest from scientists. The other two blue zones outside of Loma Linda are affiliated with geography and not a prevailing religious belief. We see that Ellen as well modeled or understood the power of Jesus' ministry of healing. Throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus not only came with a spiritual message, but he first tended to the needs and the care of those who were suffering, suffering physical ailments, suffering mental ailments, suffering spiritual ailments with demon possession. As homework for you today, if you scan just the Gospel of Mark, you will find at least 12 different narratives or occurrences of Jesus healing. And if you take a paper, I know some of you are studying with the quarterly uh, lesson, and it's all about how we um, understand and interpret scripture. So map out, do a comparison of the healings just in the gospel of Mark alone, and you will see how Mark identifies each and every one of those healings occurs with a different interaction with a different conversation, with a different format of exchange, with even a different timeline of events. In some cases, Jesus 
touches the sick and sometimes he speaks a word to them in other times they touch him sometimes it is gradual there is uh, a story of jesus mixing mud and spit and a man gradually having his sight restored and then there is of course those who are dead being brought back to life with just the call of his voice what that says to me is that Jesus ministered to individuals based on their individual and complex needs. And you will often see how the accounts of Jesus' healing are interwoven with spiritual healing. He will first say, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now get up and walk or stretch out your hand and then present yourselves to the priests. Let them declare you clean. The the uniqueness of every one of Jesus' healing interactions is something that should inspire us and encourage us in how Jesus is healing us today. You know, we champion, um, we champion God as the great physician and as the miracle worker. But I want to propose to you today that we don't overlook God as someone who nurses us in our struggle, in our sorrow, in our pain. Just because you haven't experienced the completion of healing today doesn't mean that God isn't at work healing you right now. He is like those nurses who would gently coach, gently cool the feverish brow of their patients. He is the God who is like nurses who have to um, take the brunt of their patient's pain and anger that often comes spewing at them in violent words or ungrateful um, curses. And yet he is a God who never sleeps or slumbers. He doesn't give up on tending to his hurting children. Psalm 41 puts it this way so beautifully, the Lord nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. Not all of God's healings, not all of Jesus' healings were instantaneously uh, performed or realized. Some of the healing took place in a slow or gradual manner, in a progressive way. And that is the God who continues to nurse us. Ellen White wrote this in, a, in her book, Ministry of Healing, as she reflects on the life of Jesus. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them ministered to their needs and won their confidence before he bade them follow me. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. One of my favorite um, points in the news these days when everything seems so um, heavy and fearful about the future are those rare glimpses we get in the hospital corridors when a patient recovers and is wheeled out of the ICU and nurses are lining the hallway applauding and cheering. Last week, I saw such a clip and the elderly gentleman in the wheelchair seemed confused. And he said, is this, who is this for? Is this for you? He asked the porter, pushing his wheelchair. And the porter said, no, this is for you. You've, you're in recovery and these nurses are rejoicing and celebrating with you in this moment. <clears throat> my prayer, my encouragement for nurses today is to remind yourself of Romans 15, 1 that says, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with those who are weak and not to please ourselves. And Ezekiel says, I'm your God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the straight and I will bind up the injured. I will continue to strengthen the weak. My 
uh, brothers and sisters, stand firm, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Let nothing move you, but give yourself continually to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. So many times those of us in a caregiving role wonder, what's the point? Is this making a difference? Is the effort worth it? And scripture reminds us, anything you do in your labor for the good of others is not in vain, despite what the present circumstances appear, despite how you're feeling in the moment, trust and know your care, your labor of love is not in vain. And remember, as you feel fatigued and exhausted and depleted, to seek the Lord, to find a renewal of strength in Him, so that the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance will provide for you and will guide you in your ministry to others. I'm going to invite you now to join us in worship of, of giving and offering, um, knowing that the offerings that you give here to our local church budget do things like support ministry to our community, the ministry uh, that may not be officially nursing, but that um, provides uplifted spirits, encouraged encouragement to those who are discouraged, and provisions for those who um, are hungry, and spiritually hungry and physically hungry. Um, your gifts to our local church budget will refill the fund that was paid out to feed the front lines last month and to offer continued encouragement, support, and love and to champion those who are taking risks and making sacrifices for the sake of our community health. So I invite you now, um, if you have our app, if you want to go online, to make giving part of your worship, whether that is a $5 sacrifice, a $50 sacrifice, or a $500 sacrifice. Um, God sees that you are giving from the heart, from what you have, that you are giving faithfully. And let's just take a moment in reflection and prayer to ask him to bless those contributions and to multiply them to really make a difference and to minister in healing to our city. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for bringing us together in connection. Again, Lord, we uplift those in the nursing field today, and we ask that you would enable us to use the funds we have to um, move forward the ministry of healing within our neighborhood, within our city, and our world. We ask in your holy name, amen. Join with us now as we um, close in prayer with a final worship song, and then I'll meet you back here in the chapel for a few announcements before we close off this morning. So great. 
joining us live today our online viewers from our website we're tuning in from europe we have germany chechia which i haven't seen for a while austria then in the united states loma linda california so we got a shout out today as well as in canada montreal quebec and throughout british columbia we had victoria abbotsford langley fraser valley maple ridge Pit Meadows, Tri-Cities, Greater Vancouver. Hey, just for fun, if you are um, tuning in from Facebook, we don't have the same uh, statistical analysis where you're joining from. So I see that some of you are in the chat. How about um, throw up a GIF uh, that represents uh, where you're watching from? So I'd love to see that in the Facebook chat now. Just add a, a GIF comment that represents your hometown or where you're watching from. Uh, also, as we said, from April, from uh, sort of International Nurse and Healthcare Appreciation Day, uh, Robert in the office has created these amazing signs. Uh, Adra in part is funding the appreciation and the morale boosting messages of these yard signs. You don't have a yard or a lawn, that's okay. You can stick them in your apartment window. 
but we have a few more for pickup either at our office on weekdays or just from our our front yard you can drive by the church sign and snag one for your own household we still have a few left to distribute and it's been super fun seeing them pop out up all around the city and we really do hope that it's more than a sentiment that the healthcare workers and especially nurses know you are regularly in our prayers uh, we have a prayer team that meets every thursday night and the healthcare professionals of our cities of our country of our world are always included in those prayers also hope that you'll join us in community a little later today i just want to reiterate the zoom links for our prayer calls apologies to those in the last couple of weeks who've had a hard time getting connected we've started from scratch and have a whole new uh, meeting code that should be uh, password free and accessible to you anytime we organize a group prayer just to uh, cover that one more time our prayer zoom link which means if you go to zoom.us backslash join and it asks you for a meeting number you can type in 836-9545-5843 the chat host will be putting the link up if you are following the chats on our live broadcast as well and um, again no password but you will be in a virtual waiting room till we admit you in our prayer room will open in about five minutes um, as, after we close our broadcast today, as well as at one o'clock, so in about an hour's time, we hope you will tune into another uh, Zoom space for our virtual picnic. And that meeting number that's going up should look like 998-609-10940. And that's where um, we'll join. We'll just share what we're eating. Uh, it's a rainy day, which is great because normally a church picnic would be canceled on a rainy day. But when we do it virtually, everyone just stays indoors. So put out a blanket on your living room floor or on your deck anyways have your maybe hot tea instead of iced tea. Um, we'll share with each other our favorite picnic foods. We'll do some polls, we'll play some games, um, and we'll wrap it up within an hour so that if you do want that nap this afternoon, you can still do that as well. Uh, I thank you again for joining us live. It always encourages our team to hear your messages of appreciation and to see you interacting with us um, makes us feel connected to you as well. Until next time or later today in our Zoom rooms, may God go with you. May God bless and keep you and may you feel comforted um, by the God who nurses you and is healing you and restoring you.